Good evening. My name is Jennifer Gardner, and I am the manager of programs and community engagement at Oshawa Public Libraries. It's an honor to welcome you to Resurgence, the fourth discussion in our Durham Indigenous um, Voices speaker series. We are, the land we are on is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation. And it is home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We acknowledge Oshawa is covered under the Williams Treaty. And as a settler on these lands, we are all treaty people. May we respectfully honor the knowledge and understanding of the indigenous stewards of the of these ancestral lands and ensure the voices of First Peoples are represented in our collections, programs, and services. For me, I'm a descendant of settlers from Slovakia, and I'm grateful for this traditional land I live, work, and learn on. Through this amazing collaboration, I've learned so much about truth, reconciliation, and allyship and I am humbled and thankful to have been part of this journey. We will take a moment of silence now. Thank you, miigwech. Honoring and reflecting upon the 5,000 plus children whose bodies have been discovered and those left to be uncovered. Mourning the lives of all children, families, and loved ones who have been impacted by residential schools across Turtle Island. Good evening and welcome everyone. Miigwech for joining us tonight. I'm Julia Campbell, the Adult Services Librarian at the Ajax Public Library. And I am honored to be your host and moderator for this evening's Durham Indigenous Voices program. Tonight's program is being recorded and live streamed to Facebook and will be available for follow-up viewing. This series began as a small idea and turned into a collaboration with many partners, including the Durham Region Libraries, Durham College, Ontario Tech University, both student unions, and the region of Durham. It has been amazing to watch this collaboration and to be part of the process of planning this series. The themes for our first three events have been reconciliation, resistance, and resilience. And tonight's theme is resurgence, where we will highlight and celebrate some amazing Indigenous community members who live right in the Durham region. If you missed any of the three earlier programs, I highly recommend that you watch them and the links will be posted in the chat. In the first part of our program tonight, we will hear from 14 incredible Indigenous community members, and then we will have a Q&A at the end of the program. I encourage you to submit any questions you have for our speakers in the Q&A feature in Zoom or in the Facebook comments if you're watching us from Facebook. I would like to thank our sponsors for this series, including the Rotary Club of Whitby, OPUC, and all of our collaborative partners, including the public libraries in Durham Region, Durham College, DCSI, Ontario Tech University, and the region of Durham. It has been such an honor to be part of this collaboration and to listen and learn about ways that Indigenous and non-Indigenous community members can work together to amplify and support our Indigenous community. These conversations have been a first great step and I have been so happy to see such a high turnout at all of our events. We hope that these conversations will spark action 
And it is important that as a community, we continue to listen and learn and to take action to make meaningful change. There is still a lot of work to be done. And I am happy to announce that we will be having a fifth program on September 9th called Relationship Building and Review. This will be an opportunity to debrief our conversations thus far, and we will discuss how to implement calls to action, both personally and professionally. I would encourage you all to join us for this conversation and continue the discussion. And a link to register for that event will be shared in the chat. We have many amazing guests to get to tonight. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Crystal Abitasue, Board of Directors President with Mizue Beak. Welcome, Crystal. Ani Vojo, just a thumbs up if you can hear me. Yes, I see a nod, so I'll suspect that you can. So Ani Vojo, Crystal Labatasoy, Nidish Nakaz, Anda Kamikaning Danjaba, Makwa Dudem, Anish Nabe Kwe Dao. For any of my um, friends on the line today who are not Anish Nabe, I've just introduced myself in my Ojibwe language. Uh, I am from Andakami Kaning First Nations, which is where my father's from, and my mother's from Njikaning of uh, Rama First Nations. I am from the Bear Clan, uh, and I'm a proud uh, Anishinaabe woman. So I only have five minutes today, and I also, um, you know, have the, I'm very humbled to have the first spot on today's uh, evening to kick us off in, in a good way. So I want to share a little bit about, um, you know, my journey through, uh, I guess, adolescence, starting with my education journey and finding my way um, in the big smoke of Toronto, now working for one of the, the largest banks in Canada. So I never thought that I'd work in banking. I, I immediately thought I would probably work where my grandma was working at the time. Um, she was a blackjack dealer uh, at Casino Rama. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to be a blackjack dealer. And that was kind of my first thought when I was thinking about uh, opportunities. And, you know, what I can really say is that I kind of fell into banking. I was applying to student awards programs. Uh, at the time, RBC had one for Indigenous students. It was a quite a lengthy application, but at the end of it, it, it had said, would you want to work at one of our branches uh, full time during your summer months? And I probably didn't want to at the time, but I said, if I, th I thought to myself, if I had said yes, that maybe I would have um, a better chance of winning the scholarship. Uh, long story short, I didn't win the scholarship. However, they did call me and ask if I wanted to work uh, during the summer months as a teller. And I was really reluctant and scared because I don't have anyone that's ever worked in the finance industry. And myself, um, you know, I really struggled in school in in math. And I was a take I was taking accounting. I remember in my first year of my undergrad and failing it actually. <laughs> so I was like, I don't think numbers and banking is for me. And um, so I was kind of turning down the opportunity when it was first presented to me. But I was so happy that. Uh, at the age of 18, um, you know, just speaking really transparently to the recruiter, uh, she had mentioned that, you know, we live in a world now where technology is doing all the calculations. And that if you like working with people, you like working with, in a team. And she kind of knew I had a bubbly persona and, and, and I think good communication skills. She's like, this might be a great opportunity for you. And, you know, fast forward to almost 12 years later, I'm still working at the bank. So she, she made a good call. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's been a very rewarding journey. I think I've, I've always wanted to stay uh, really close to community. Um, you know, even when I was aspiring for my first job, I was thinking of, of living in, on my mom's community, but uh, I think I've always, you know, really been drawn to, to working with our people and doing, you know, doing good work. And so I, I think in any position that I, that I was started to get at the, in the banking world, I was finding opportunities to do uh, Indigenous initiatives, projects, um, anything I get, could get my hands on really that kept me engaged with our, our urban Toronto Indigenous community. And uh, so really from that, I, I actually was really fortunate enough to have great managers who really thought the work that I was doing was important um, and gave me the opportunity to actually do some of these 
these projects that I had in my mind at, you know, at the, at the ripe age of 19, 20, 21. And so um, I started off in Canadian banking as a, as a teller and then a financial service representative, and then just continued to volunteer for, for initiatives. Um, and it was at a, an actual Toronto event uh, that I met my first mentor who was an HR professional. She was quite senior and she took a liking to me. And from that experience, uh, you know, we we formed a bond, and she was actually really um, instrumental in getting my getting my first internship uh, in the corporate office uh, in banking. And from there, I just kind of really just took it upon myself to do a lot of HR programming. Um, you know, some of you may know of RBC Student Awards program and their internship program. I was kind of building out those programs uh, in my early twenties because I have an HR background. And uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was just quite interesting. I think um, I, I slowly went from like a, a coordinator role into a specialist role into an into a manager role, and um, it's it's really fueled my passion because it's it's good work. And so I'm, you know, I'd say I'm I'm lucky enough to have a job where I don't actually feel like I'm going to a job. I'm quite passionate about building programming um, and strategy uh, for the financial industry, and part of my job. Um, has been sharing my story and I'm you know again really lucky to have that opportunity to speak to Indigenous youth other people um, that you know never thought of banking as well but now do because they've heard my story um, and now working at TD I do a lot of uh, strategy for the bank um, still very much uh, looking at Indigenous people strategy on what they and what we're doing from a customer colleague and community perspective now that's my day job. What I do on the side is um, I, I still volunteer very much and I'm really focused on um, employment uh, for indigenous community, not just in the urban center, but across across Canada. And so the two organizations, um, I believe Julie had mentioned, I'm, I do, uh, I am on the board of Misway Beak Aboriginal Employment and Training Center of Toronto. And then I also do some work with IPAC, the Indigenous Professional Association of Canada. So I'll put a plug in that if um, you're in the city of Toronto, please uh, take a look at our website. Uh, I think they're going to share a link to uh, one of the commercials we did, but a lot of great resources, a lot of first raising scholarships um, if you're going back to school. Uh, if you'd like to switch jobs, um, at, at any point in your career, you're able to, to, to do so. And then for IPAC, the Indigenous Professional Association of Canada, really what it is is just building more network um, network growth uh, amongst indigenous professionals across the country and i i don't like using the word professional because like, i find it a little bit taboo just if you want to network and kind of understand what other folks and peers are doing in other um, organizations i think for me when i started off um, in the financial industry i just wanted to see um, people that had done it before. And so that was that opportunity for me to to network. So I think I've spoken for, for more than five minutes. So I do apologize. I know that we have a lot of great speakers, but um, please connect with me on LinkedIn, uh, also social social media. My handle is K-A-B-O-T-O-S-S. -S, so it's K-A-B-O-T-O-S. I uh, really would love to stay connected to everyone and see how you guys uh, progress in your own uh, journeys and uh, endeavors. So Chimi Gudge, Bon Appetit, until we meet again, it was such a pleasure to speak with, with all of you today. Thank you, Crystal, so much for being our first speaker tonight and for sharing your story and journey with us and about all the work you do for the Indigenous community. Our next speaker tonight is Summer Bird, entrepreneur and owner of Vera Jewelry. Welcome, Summer. Hello, thank you for having me. First of all, I'm just going to take a moment to share my screen here. Okay, great. All right, okay, so um, my name is Summer Bird. I am an Ojibwe young woman from Northern Ontario. I currently live in Oshawa right now. And I like to describe myself as a history enthusiast, an artist and an entrepreneur. Um, just a little bit of getting into who I am. Um, sorry, I'm gonna move. So um, I'm of course of indigenous descent, descent sorry, I am Ojibwe. My father's from Neokemiguaning or Whitefish Bay First Nations. 
home of the Whitefish Bay Singers, if anybody is familiar. Um, we moved around a lot and I have three siblings and all of them are female. So just a house full of women. Uh, we're all animal lovers. Um, I like to think of myself as just a general creator because I have a crazy amount of hobbies. I have a crazy amount of crafts that I do. I've always done painting and jewelry and art. Um, I also had a career in makeup for a little while. Um, in school, I was an A plus student. I went to University of Toronto for archeology, span never finished it. I went to Durham College for graphic design. Pandemic happened and I also didn't finish that. Um, but overall, I've got a huge passion for education and a huge passion for uh, sciences and history. Um, I've got it down here that I'm the Ross of the group. So if anybody's familiar with friends, I kind of have a lot of boring facts that I think are really fun and no one else does. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit of who I am, my background, where I'm coming from. I wrote down some of my personal accomplishments that are overcoming depression, starting my own business, um, helping others as in like those in need and always maintaining a positive personality and attitude. And then, so of course, beer jewelry. This is my little business and it's my jewelry business that I started in the pandemic. I had just deferred the year for at Durham College because online schooling was a little tough for, for me. <laughs> and so I started my own business as a way to have something to be proud of myself for. As a, it's, I started it to really feed multiple passions, which are social justice, um, women empowerment or two-spirit empowerment and of course jewelry. I love jewelry <laughs> and um, one of the main things that I'm really really happy and proud of is the opportunities that this has started for me and something that I've been really it's important for me to share at any chance that I can is like if you have an idea or something to start a small business just do it. It's the best thing I ever did. Not only has this brought me income, it's helped me understand and get close to my community. I've got so much of a bigger circle now. I'm getting to know other small businesses. It's something that even though I did just defer my school year, which might not have been a very positive thing for a lot of people, I've been able to feel so much pride and feel so proud of myself for my ability to do something cool. <laughs> and I think that it's had an overall really positive response. Uh, these are just some of my favorite pictures of things that I've been able to create and sell. Um, uh, everything that I do is gold or silver plated and uh, it doesn't turn your neck green. And they're usually pretty on the affordable side. I try to keep it as affordable as possible. <laughs> but so my motto um, uh, nowadays, I always say that it's still my motto from Nike because I, it's something that I wish I could have learned a little sooner is like literally just do it. Um, no matter what you're doing, no matter what skill you're learning, if you're like me and you just collect them all, <laughs> or if you're going back to school for the third time, or if you want to be happier in life, like literally, you don't even have to believe in yourself. Just do it because it always will work out in your favor if you put effort into something and believe in something and just, just do it. Just, you know, Google it, do it, live life. <laughs> and um, yeah, so let me see now. All right, yeah. And then my little plug here at the end, I've got my website, I'm on Instagram and Facebook. I struggle with Facebook, so I'm not as active on there, but you could definitely message me on there. Um, I'm always open for a conversation or if you have anything in mind, I can help you provide. Um, and yeah, so thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about myself and my business. And yeah, thank you. How do I exit this now? <laughs> Thank you, Summer, so much for sharing your story with us tonight and your experience with starting your own business. I thought you had such an inspirational message and your jewelry is just beautiful. So thank you so much. Thank it is you. now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Tamara Green, chef and owner of Indigenesis Cuisine. Welcome, Tamara. Hi, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, a little bit about my business. I started it um, three years ago. And at the time, well, really I started about three and a half years ago. At the time I was still a student at um, Durham College. 
I was taking uh, culinary management and then I also took advanced baking. And I was just thinking about my Jura, who is uh, Mohawk. Um, he lives on the Tyndanega Reserve. And I just, I really wanted to do something to honor him. So I was, I was racking my brain thinking, okay, what can I do, a culinary student do to honor my grandfather? So I started thinking about like a, a six course, six nations meal. Thought, okay, I'm gonna do this. So I went to do my research and then I found out that no one knows what indigenous cuisine really is. And I just found that so sad. So as I was looking up all these recipes, I saw bannock made with wheat flour, made with milk, made with baking powder, which were all ingredients that were not available before settlers came. So obviously there was another way of making it or another cuisine entirely. So from that, my curiosity was really piqued and I was determined to figure out how I could do this pre-contact which was quite the undertaking. Uh, over the next several months, I contacted over 30 um, museums, band offices, historical societies, um, and other indigenous people that I knew to really find out what is pre-contact food? How, how do I get the ingredients? How do I cook them? And how do I go from here? And as I was doing all this research, um, the executive chef at Bistro 67 in Whitby uh, which is the uh, college's restaurant, I was going through the halls and he saw me, you know, digging deep in papers and research and sort of poked his head by and asked, what you doing? So I told him and he kind of stepped back and nodded and was like, why don't we put that dinner on at the bistro? And I didn't know what to do with that. That was great news to me, um, but also terrifying news. Uh, because I was still a student, I'm like, how am I going to do this? Sure, now I, I, I have a rough idea of how to cook this cuisine, but where do I go from here? And he gave me full leeway. He said, we're just here to support you. You take complete lead on this. So the night came, it went over very well. And from that, uh, a lady from the Mississaugas of Skugog Island First Nation who was then in charge of the infrastructure for um, the island. Uh, she came to the dinner and she tried the food and she loved it. Um, so we exchanged contact information. She kept in touch with me through the coming months and very soon I was graduated and she asked, I'd like you to be our preferred caterer for the island, all of our events. And I had a business. I, I didn't have to worry about what I was going to do after I graduated. I, I had a business. Um, but that didn't mean that uh, there wasn't still learning to do. I'm even today still learning more about um, Indigenous cuisine uh, and how to be an entrepreneur. Um, but it's definitely been a, a great ride uh, for me. Uh, all the contacts, the lovely people that I've met along the way. Um, the one thing about what I do is I use pre-colonial ingredients only. I don't use anything that was introduced, but I do use more modern techniques because even if the settlers didn't come, the people of this land would have developed techniques in their own way and in their own time. And I'd like to show that, show that it's not just stuck in the past. Um, I try and take inspiration from the great law of the Iroquois considering the seventh generation. So I consider seven generations behind me, what they did and why they did it. And also how what I'm doing now is going to affect seven generations ahead of me. So I don't want to just show this as an archaic form of cooking, but I want to show how it's relevant today and how it will be relevant in our future. Because worldwide, food has a huge impact on what a culture is. And I don't think any Canadian can really understand what it is to be Canadian if we don't understand what's original to our land and how that differentiates us from other cultures. 
Um, so long story short, uh, they say that it takes three years to make a business. And uh, I am finding this year that that is true. There are larger opportunities um, coming my way. Um, I've had a chance to give input to the Indigenous uh, Food Tourism for Ontario. Uh, and I will have further opportunity in the coming years, which I look forward to. Thank you so much for uh, taking these five minutes to listen to what I do and why I do it. Thank you so much, Tamara, for sharing your story and journey with us tonight. I had a chance to see some of your videos and photos of your food and it looks amazing. So I encourage everyone to check it out. Our next speaker is Melissa Harley, entrepreneur and business owner of the Adventure Away Co Travel Agency. Welcome, Melissa. Hi, um, my name is Melissa Harley. Um, I am a travel agent and business owner of Adventure Away Travel Company. We are a boutique travel agency here in the Durham region, and we're a completely web-based company with high-touch customer services. Um, we tailor our trips completely to customer needs, and we aren't just a website, but we're real people with real feedback and recommendations and advice. Um, all of our services are available by phone and online at adventureaway.ca. And this job has given me the great opportunity to work for myself for the past nine years from home. Through my agency and my work experience, I've been able to follow my passion and be able to travel all across the world. Um, I'm a mom, and so my business has taken me uh, to a bit of a niche where I've developed a market catering to families. And uh, just to fill you in on a few of my business tips, because I don't really uh, want to share travel tips at this time. It's not a great business to be in at the moment, um, but I did want to share a bit about behind the scenes in, in my business. Um, I've asked them to put up a picture of me here at Disney World, um, which is almost become like a second home to me. And it's a lot of fun to deal with every day. Um, Disney is a phenomenal company that I love working with, not only on the travel side, but also learning business skills through their entrepreneur programs and learning workshops. And if you haven't checked them out and you want to further your career, engage your staff or your students in top-notch training, they actually do a lot of, on, have a lot of online resources to do this. Um, I found in the customer service or hospitality fields, their courses are really highly endorsed and a great asset to resumes. Another great asset I wanted to share for any students from an Indigenous perspective is reaching out to your own community, even if you haven't been a part of it. I grew up in Northern Ontario, but actually haven't even visited the community that my family was from, which is the Lac Sewell Band. Um, however, when I reached out to the educational services within that community, they were really able to assist me in getting the resources to get an education. And um, I completed Niagara College college programs. So I took hospitality management and tourism development. And with their assistance, I even spent part of my college career teaching tourism at a college in Lithuania that was part of what bit me with the travel bug. So all through my career, I've actually been able to maintain working relationships with the resources and they've counseled me through continuing education opportunities and resources. Um, even once I started my business and joined the workforce. And um, one of my biggest um, pillars of my business model has been being involved in the community. And I found that the best networking and marketing that I can do is simply joining the community and um, participating in events like we are doing tonight. And not only does it help drastically with sales, I actually just started this business as a hobby but it's really been able to propel me into doing what I love full time. And um, by being part of the community, volunteering and participating in community events, and even just being a part of my children's school, it's been easy networking. Uh, it's been fun and it's been profitable because then you as a business are being recognized and recommended. And at the same time, when you're an indigenous person within the community and making lots of connections, you're slowly removing the barriers and bridging the understanding with those who might not even have met an indigenous person because they're still out there and that's so important. Um, so I'm sure we'll discuss that a little bit more this evening, 
but thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of the learning today. Thank you so much, Melissa, for sharing your story and experiences with us tonight. I loved your emphasis on community, and I agree with you that that is so important. Um, our next speaker tonight is artist Kaylee Higgins. Welcome, Kaylee. I did not realize I had a grass background, but here I am. Ani Bojo, Kay Ndishnikaz, Nindigo, Ajibne Wong, Siguan Wago, Shmanadu, Michigan and Dodem, Oshawa and Dunjaba. Uh, with be in Dundee, in Anishinaabe, Nij, Manduag. Uh, so my name is Kay. Um, I'm Julie's daughter. So thank you for having me here tonight. Um, I'm a student. Thank you, Missy. Um, I'm a student at X University, or um, if you call it Ryerson University. Hopefully, they change the name soon. But I'm in my third year of the photography studies program there, and. Uh, I think I'm here tonight to just share a video that I made for one of my classes. I, if I can drop it in the chat, I can do that. There's a link. Um, and I never thought that I would be doing so many like video panels during COVID um, for a video I made in school, but I just had a project and my professor just told me you can do whatever you want, make it between three to five minutes, have fun. And I decided to do more video on myself and my culture to show to my classmates. Um, yes, there's my mother in the chat. Woo, woo. <laughs> oh, there is another Julie, but it's not Julie. Okay. Um, but yeah, if you want to check it out and I can add my Instagram in the chat, but my photography, um, I like to revolve it around marginalized groups of people, my friends, other Indigenous people, telling stories of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and two-spirit people. Um, but yeah, that is all. And I'm just going to share your video. Yes, I also put it in the chat unless you want to screen share. My maternal grandmother's last name is Najwang. In Ojibwe, this means beautiful. In my great uncle's words, not human beauty, but the beauty of nature. I have to agree, humanity can be ugly. Growing up as an indigenous person in the suburbs, my culture was more or less absent. Although my mother was a social worker for abused indigenous women and children for over 20 years, I grew up as a white kid. My name is Kaylee. In Scottish Gaelic, this means celebration, but I feel I have little to celebrate, existing in between somewhere and nowhere, white and brown, privileged and marginalized. My great uncle was the same way one white parent and one indigenous parent. He called himself a half-breed, not wolf nor dog. I think this is a harsh way to think about yourself, but I still share his pain and confusion. I have pale skin, blue eyes, and brown hair. I do not speak my language, not fluently at least. I do not practice my traditional ways of life, but this is not my fault, nor my parents or grandparents or great-grandparents. This is the fault of colonialism and forced assimilation. Because of this, I was always confused growing up. I looked like this, but had my aunt making me ribbon dresses. My middle name is Rose, while they gave my younger brother an Ojibwe middle name, Padabin, meaning first light. While my mother tried to get us to reconnect with our culture, my grandmother tried to take us to church. My entire life, I have been assessing trauma much of which stems from generations before me. One, my mother was racially profiled at a clinic in Toronto, which was founded by her uncle. Two, my grandmother received a letter from the Canadian government after she married my grandfather, who was a white man. 
whereby, according to the 1869 Enfranchisement Act, my grandmother and her children were no longer considered status Indians. This act was not reviewed until over a hundred years later, in 1985. 3. My great-uncles, aunts, and grandparents, being emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically, and sexually abused in residential schools. 4. Their assimilation led them and their children and their children's children to become Christian and lose connection to their culture and language. 5. My great uncle's sons fishing on the reserve and being arrested by the Ministry of Natural Resources in 1992. The Supreme Court charged them with $35,000. 6. My grandmother and her siblings all have different spellings of their last name, either Najwan with an O or with an A, due to the residential school system. Nuns did not care about correct spelling, and many of the children were not literate and did not speak English, and I carry all of this with me. They say it takes seven generations to heal, but I fear that my people won't ever get that opportunity. And although my culture was stolen from me, I am slowly starting to find my way back. So when I shower, I sing the water song. When I am sick, I pick cedar and make tea with it. When I am overwhelmed, I smudge to ground myself, and I listen to my elders share stories to reconnect with my culture, even in the smallest of ways. So when people ask me, well, how indigenous are you really? Or what percentage are you? I think that I have carried the burden of my ancestors long enough. I am indigenous enough. Thank you, Kay, so much for sharing your truth and for this sharing the story of your family. Your video is just beautifully done and so powerful. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Our next speaker tonight is lacrosse player Thomas Hogarth. Thomas plays for the Rochester Nighthawks in the National Lacrosse League. Welcome, Thomas. Oh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Thomas Hogarth. Uh, I hold my status through my mother's side with uh, Tetley Gwich'in, which is in Northwest Territories. I also have uh, lineage in uh, Curve Lake First Nation uh, through my father's side. I am Wolf Clan. I played lacrosse for uh, Peterborough Senior A Lakers uh, during the summertime. We have won three man cups in a row and are going on to our fourth uh, next summer. I play uh, professional lacrosse in uh, the National Lacrosse League. I got drafted to uh, Georgia 18th overall when I was 18. I got drafted uh, four years earlier than I was supposed to. Uh, Georgia then traded me to uh, Vancouver shortly after the draft where I spent three years of uh, my career playing for there, or playing for them. I got traded uh, to Buffalo in 2018 where we made uh, a run for the championship and came sh short in the finals losing uh, in overtime to Calgary. Buffalo traded me to uh, Rochester, where I am now. Rochester is uh, a new team to the league. So uh, they're just starting to rebuild, which means they won't be competitive for a couple of years. I have uh, played for uh, Team Iroquois at the world stage and national stage. I have won gold in uh, nationals, beating uh, Team Ontario in the finals. We placed uh, second in the world stage in 2019, losing to Team Canada. I was given the chance to uh, play for Team Canada or Team Iroquois at that time. It was uh, an easy decision on myself because I wanted, uh, I chose Team Iroquois because I wanted to uh, represent my nation as well as other nations at the world stage. I was uh, the first Tet League witch and athlete to compete at the world stage and uh, I took uh, great pride representing them. Growing, uh, growing up playing sports for non-Indigenous teams in hockey and lacrosse in the Pedro area. I, I grew up facing racism. I, I would get made fun of for being different from other players. And the, the one that hurt the most was uh, receiving uh, racism from my own teammates. I had uh, family members who attended re residential schools. My mother was a part of the 60 Scoop and lost her identity. This resulted in uh, me losing mine and not really feel welcomed by others or because I didn't even know myself. I just uh, knew I was different from others from the, tre the treatment I was receiving. In high school, uh, my so-called friends would make racial slurs to me and they would joke around saying they were kidding. 
I grew up just outside of Curve Lake First Nation, so I knew the culture, but was uh, ashamed to practice or even talk about it because of racism I was facing. When I turned 16, I then became then began to uh, be interested into the culture and, and the traditions. Even today, I still face racism playing sports. Whenever we play Six Nations in the cross, uh, my teammates in Peterborough still make slurs in the dressing room regarding uh, the players that I'm actually friends with. I found uh, turning to the culture and traditions has allowed me to uh, be proud of who I am as an Indigenous person. I wish when I was younger, I knew uh, more about the culture and was proud to be Indigenous. Uh, the racism I received allowed me to find uh, a career path outside of lacrosse as well that would allow me to help Indigenous people. I work for uh, Nogdwenmug Benojug Child and Family Services as a child and youth worker in the Piro office. In my practice, I, I make sure to always incorporate the culture and the seven grandfather teachings. The culture allowed me to find balance in my life and has allowed me to provide care to the ones I serve. I'm proud to be Indigenous and I'm proud of uh, who I am. I do believe I wouldn't be where I am today without all the racism I faced. It allowed me to discover myself and uh, rekindle my lost identity by turning to the culture, which then allowed me to uh, succeed in the cross career because I used the cross as a coping mechanism when I was receiving the racism. Uh, I think I only had five minutes. Uh, I guess miigwech to everyone for listening. Thank you, Thomas, so much for sharing your story and truth with us tonight. I just wanted to remind everyone, if you have any questions for any of our speakers, to please put them in the Q&A in the Zoom, or if you're watching us from Facebook, to put the questions in the chat, and we will address them after the presentations. Our next speaker tonight is Jalen Jarrett, INIC Student and Training and Development Manager. Welcome, Jalen. Hi everybody, um, my name is Jalen. Um, uh, um, good afternoon and welcome. Um, so like I said, my name is Jalen. I'm currently living in unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin territory, also known as Ottawa. Um, I'm Inuk and I'm Guyanese. Um, I'm a recent graduate, I'm a writer, mm -hmm. I'm an educator and I'm a mom to a four month old baby boy. Um, so since I only have five minutes, I think I'll just kind of get into who I am, um, my education, and where this led me today. Um, so I'm originally from a really small community in Northern Labrador called Ne Nunatsevut. Um, I lived there with my, and I was raised by my Anansik and my Datsyuk, so my grandmother and my grandfather. Um, they raised me um, with my language, my culture, um, and on the land, and that plays a huge role um, um, in who I am today and my values. Um, when I was nine or 10 years old, well, between eight and nine, I was in foster care. Um, that also plays a big part of who I am. Um, I, I, my grandmother, she was also a residential school survivor. So being um, raised with her um, plays a big role in like my experiences. Um, so when I was nine, nine, 10 years old, I moved with my um, Ghani side of my family in Ajax. I had never really left my community before and it was my first time moving to a really big city um and it was kind of like a whole other world for me um it was my first time moving out of my community and honestly it was a huge huge shock and, and like i said this is my first time meeting my guy and he said my family so like that was like uh that was really huge for me as well um because i was raised like i said i was raised in oak um at that time in durham there were no cultural programs for any um, and what I find happens a lot is we get um, lost in pan indigeneity, which is like a huge problem in and of itself. Um, and because I'm Afro indigenous and because like I'm black and I'm in a, living in the suburbs, I was kind of passed off as just being um, mixed and nobody really attended to like my, my culture and um, where I was really coming from. Um, I know at the time, like there were educators who were a little bit confused because like I had been speaking broken English and whatnot, but nobody really honed into, into that for me and, um, and fostered my culture. Um, and so growing, growing up in Durham at the time was really difficult for me because um, I think over time I realized that people weren't going to adapt to who I was. Um, 
and uh, so I kind of had to adapt to the people around me so my culture kind of got left on the back burner and I I'm still to this day very close with my Anansia, with my grandmother, but um, there's only so much that she could do from being so far away. Um, and so I stayed in Ajax until I was 18 years old. Um, and I went to high school there. Um, I had, I guess, like my my um, teenage years there. And then I decided to move to Ottawa. And um, I moved to Ottawa to um, pursue my bachelor's degree at Carleton University. Um, and I just recently graduated with um, a double degree in law and indigenous studies. Um, and my education, um, while it was, it was, there was like a twofold to it. Um, it was really amazing because I got to um, connect with Indigenous people um, and a lot of Inuit in my institution. I also got to move to Ottawa where there's like a really huge population of Inuit. So I got to practice my language again. I got to be um, back in my culture and sort of immersed in my culture. Um, and so that was really amazing. And um, uh, being in university, I, it kind of took me away from community in certain ways. Um, but again, in, in the community my, itself, I found, um, or in university itself, I found a really good community. Um, so what I what ended up happening was through my education, um, I realized that a lot of um, what I was doing is I was educating people a lot. Like I would always sit down and have conversations with settlers. Um, with um, other BIPOC individuals. And I was just constantly educating and educating. And so, um, and I was also working for the, uh, I was doing kind of uh, contracts with the federal government as well. And even in those contracts I was doing like summer contracts, I was also doing a lot of educating. Um, and I think um, I got to a point where I was um, kind of like, you know, I think I'm going to take a step back and um, start creating actual like formal workshops and creating formal, um, I guess, uh, these little mini, um, mini series, I guess you could call it. Um, so I started to um, get hired by different um, organizations to kind of put together um, these, uh, like, like who Inuit, who um who Inuit are and because like I said like a lot of people um we get lost in pan-indigeneity so um that's something I started to do and I guess I'm starting still starting to build on it right now because I just graduated and I had a baby um so that business is starting to um, get on the move um and I also work for um a really amazing uh, non-profit organization called Canadian Roots Exchange and um, there I got to put on a lot of cultural programming. Um, I think the media sent out some, uh, media team sent out some pictures of me. Um, so I got, for example, the opportunity to uh, order two whole tuktus, which are caribous. Um, and I got to order matak, which is like whale blower, so traditional food. And um, I got to uh, bring together like, uh, well, my organization brought thousands of people together. So I was able to sh kind of share my um, traditional foods. And um, I was, I'm e even in a position where I'm able to get my nansiak, uh, my grandmother involved. Um, and she um, will like help me create videos for like my mini series and stuff. So um, yeah, that's like a little bit of, um, of what I do for work. And outside of that, um, I like to write. I'm currently working on um, a little project. Um, I guess like a, I guess you'd call it like a book. <laughs> um, so I'm working on that right now. Um, but again, like it's a little bit hard because I just had a baby. Um, and yeah, this is a little bit about who I am. Um, and then in the fall, I'm um, next year in September, I'm currently uh, writing my LSAT. So potentially might go to law school. Um, and if not, then I, um, I hope to pursue uh, my master's. Um, I'm working with a couple organizations right now um, to uh, showcase a lot of like of uh, Afro-indigeneity um, that exists in Ottawa um, and that exists in Canada in general. Um, I think that uh, um, we have a lot of, um, there's like this notion that uh, Afro-Indigenous people don't exist, but we do exist and we're here. Um, and uh, so I really wanna be an advocate for that and show people, um, you know, Afro-Indigenous people are here. And I also wanna um, show people that, you know, Inuit are here and we shouldn't be getting lost in this pan indigeneity that happens a lot. Um, and we have, we're a very distinct people with a very distinct culture. Um, and it's important that um, Canada, you know, know who we are. We might be a little far up north, but we're still here. And, um, and yeah, so that's a little bit about who I am, um, what I do. I think my Instagram is dropped in the comments. Um, 
so yeah, follow me, interact with me. I like to post a lot of um, educational things on my Instagram as well. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody. Have a nice night. Thank you, Jalen, for sharing your story and journey with us tonight. I love your emphasis on education and your inspirational message and congrats on the new little one. Our next speaker tonight is Beanie John, hoop dancer. Welcome, Beanie. Hello, everyone. Danse, pewao. My name is Beanie John. I'm Plains Korean Taino from Kihiwan, Alberta. Um, I've been dancing, hoop dancing since I was nine years old. Um, I'm also a grass dancer. Um, I also got that into that when I was nine years old. I got initiated uh, during that time in the early 2000s. Um, and my way of resurgence, um, hoop dancing is a form of storytelling. Um, I go into reserves, uh, communities, schools, and I teach about um, kind of finding your voice um, and what that looks like. Sometimes it's not always about how we talk, but it's about what we show through our dance. And that's what hoop dancing does. Um, I was really shy when I was younger. Um, you know, I didn't do a lot of talking, couldn't even order food, couldn't even talk on the phone. But hoop dancing really gave me my voice. Um, it allowed me to share a story through movement and dance um, and music. Uh, if you ever seen hoop dancing, it's usually done to the powwow drum. It's, uh, it happens at a powwow, it's a form of gathering, um, and usually during the supper break. Um, and at that time, uh, hoop dancers come out. Usually sometimes there's two to three hoop dancers, sometimes only one, um, and they go out there and do their thing. They're kind of like the magicians of the power arena. Um, they show and do all the things like, um, you know, it's like an illusion that's happening. It's taking you on a journey of what, what they see throughout, the, throughout their journey, uh, throughout their travels is what I'm trying to say. Um, and so I used to do it to uh, powwow music, uh, which is like vocables. Um, and I would do that at the powwows. But when I was going into communities, um, a lot of our youth were you know, into hip hop, contemporary music. They were into a lot of other stuff. So I was trying to figure out, um, you know, how can we get our youth and, and this contemporary music and our culture all together? Um, so what my family did is, oh, I'm a part of a family dance troupe called Kihua Native Dance Theater. Um, and I've literally been in it since the day I was born. Um, my story always starts in a cradle board. Uh, I was eight hours old when I went to my first powwow, if you can believe it, um, believe it, eight hours. Uh, I went to Curve Lake, uh, was my first powwow I've ever been to. I uh, got a chance to go, uh, get honored there as a newborn baby. But from there, I went into the cradle board. Uh, cradle board, if you're not familiar with that is, is it's almost like putting a, a baby in a moss bag or swaddling them. And once they're swaddled, you put them in their moss bag and then you put them in their cradle board. And what that does is it allows them to almost feel like they're in the womb again. And that feeling of being in the womb is a feeling of comfort. Um, and when they're in the womb, um, they're safe and they hear that heartbeat. When you're born, the cradle board mimics that. Um, and it gives you a little bit more because you're in this world you wanna experience. Uh, the thing I love about the cradle board is that your baby is on the same level as you uh, all the time because they're on your back, whether you're hanging them up, you know, depending on what you're doing, leaning your baby up and they have like this cool protective thing over. So, you know, if they ever were to fall or anything like that, they were always protected. Um, and when they're in that cradle board, the first thing they want to do is start moving around and moving their arms around. And then they hear that power music, that heartbeat that mimics their mother, you know, their matriarch. And from there, they start bouncing. So I say I start, you know, dancing uh, literally out of the womb, right into my cradle board, and, and then fell right into hoops. Uh, hoops are, have taken me all over the world. Um, I can, I went down to, you know, Mexico, New Zealand, Europe. Uh, I've been traveling since the day I was born. I, I've lived on a plane. Um, I've slept on a bus, you know, wherever my hoops need to go, that's where, that's where I got to go. Um, and then a lot of the times I'm, I'm doing workshops with a lot of, uh, a lot of Indigenous youth. And a lot of the times they get to make their own hoops. And when they make their own hoops and they experience that, that connection, because the cool thing about hoops is it starts off in like this coil. 
it's a coil of a uh, plumbing tubing and that plumbing tubing you have to cut it depending on your you know your height how how much you want to move through it how much flow you want to have what colors you want so they get to go through this whole thing of making pretty much making their whole life within this hoop because with a hoop it's a circle with our circle it holds everything if you hold it sideways you see everything if you hold it up you see everything that encompasses in that circle so with our youth once they get to start making their circle and they connect that and when you connect that hoop it's with wood and i always like it because it's dowling it's wood it's part of mother nature even though the hoops are plastic and are man-made there's still that little form of mother earth in there and once you connect it it's that hoop it's that power it, it just keeps on going and going and going and the cool thing about hoops is they just keep you know, you can pass them down, you can put them away, you can use them anytime you want. And um, it's just a good way to, to let that energy out. Um, whenever you're feeling frustrated, I just go to my hoops. Um, if you don't know how to make hoops, a good way to go out is to go out to your local park, try to find some red willow. Once you find that red willow, um, Google a little bit of what red willow does, because red willow is in Tylenol. Uh, it's a good thing for selves. Um, if you have sore bones, if you want to have a cedar bath, just make sure you're not allergic to ASA because my mom is and red willow isn't good for that. But if you can't get your hands on, you know, the hoops that you usually see, which are the plastic ones, you can find your traditional hoops. You can find that traditional sinew. Hoops were traditionally made out of red willow. Red willow is a healing. It's a healing property. So just, a, just touching red willow just makes you feel good. And if you could just go out and harvest that member to always leave a gift behind. Um, for me, it's tobacco. Sometimes, you know, if you have chocolate, if you have something that means a little bit to you that you're you can allow to give up, um, give that up for 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 that for that teaching for that gift. Um, and that goes with everything. You know, if you're if you're going to learn something, you know, you should always give and then you can receive. Um, but hoop dancing is my resurgence. It's my awakening. It's my calling. I love it. And um, I just want to share it with everyone. So um, hi, hi, and thank you so much for allowing me to just share just a tad bit of what I do. Um, and I love you all and have a beautiful, beautiful evening and so many other great speakers. Hi, hi. Thank you so much, Beanie, for being with us tonight. I saw some videos of you on YouTube doing your hoop dancing and you are incredible. So I encourage everybody to go and check it out. It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Derek Marsden, TV personality and entrepreneur. Welcome, Derek. Hey there, how are you? Uh, okay, we only have five minutes, so I'm gonna hammer this home. Uh, I've got two TV shows that I host called Sheltered and Reno My Reno. I was able to travel around the world and live with different indigenous cultures all over. Uh, with Africa, Costa Rica, Peru. Um, you would be able to see that on APTN and Sheltered was probably the first and most, I would say, um, open, awakening that I had with really feeling worthy of, you know, becoming more than just, um, just just a guy from from the reserve uh i guess i should jump into saying too i'm uh ojibwe from alderville first nation um i've also got a carpentry business and i've worked in film for 15 years now uh i think that with the different things that you can do in life everybody thinks that you need to always just be linear you need to just be straight as an arrow going through your steps because you've been taught go to school go to school some more get a job but i think really it's more like a river you're going to end up going left you're going to end up going right uh some of the great things that i got to do with uh film and carpentry mixed together is i was able to go to italy and rejuvenate a whole restaurant bar in a norwegian um, cruise line I've been able to travel the world to different indigenous cultures and speak 
to um, all different reserves as a keynote speaker talking about, um, you know, following your dreams and, and pushing forward and, and, you know, believing in yourself. And one of the hardest things for me was making that leap, making that leap to be able to um, believe that you were capable of success and that it wasn't just you know, go out and get a job. You could follow your dreams. You could be creative. That you could make a difference. And believe me when I when I tell you that as soon as I took that leap, I think that it helped me. You know, bring in a whole new layer of myself to be able to share with others. Um, one of the other speakers you guys are going to listen to is a fantastic young man i've been able to watch him grow jordan mowat and i was able to you know be one of the first guys from our reserve to have his own tv show so with that came a whole broad bunch of questions from the youth on how they can be able to move forward with their creative nature without being bullied without being able to um be afraid of what could happen and failure because you know, with every great success comes the fear of failure and it will happen. You will fail, but you know, you have a lot of people to believe in you and you, when you believe in yourself, you'll be able to really get out there and go for it. Um, geez, I, I, I don't know what else to say. I just fired off a whole bunch of information. I hope that it helps. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, Derek, so much for sharing your story and experiences with us tonight and also for your message of believing in yourself. And if you'd Thank like you. to check out the series that Derek was in, the link has been posted to the chat. It is now time to welcome our next speaker, who Derek mentioned, Jordan Mowat, drummer and singer-songwriter. Welcome, Jordan. Ah, right on. Honey, bonjour. Can you wear? Happy to give you a in Wavetuck, Indigenous Cause, all the real First Nation and Don Jaba, Weezing Donda, Wabijaji Do Dem, Michi Sagig, Nishnabe, and Da. So, greetings. Hello, everybody. Um, you heard my traditional name there. Happy to give you a gap in but my name is uh, Jordan Moat. I'm from Alderville First Nation, uh, but I currently reside in uh, Nipissing First Nation, and uh, I'm I'm from uh, the Martin Clan, and I'm uh, Mississauga Ojibwe, Mississauga Anishinaabe. Uh, so yeah, that was uh, Derek Marsden there. Gosh, he's a handsome fella, and uh, yeah, he he really did help me a lot when I was going through uh, uh, going through some things and. Uh, especially through high school, I had a lot of dreams and aspirations that I wanted to uh, go after and achieve. And so he helped, he helped me uh, set a lot of goals. And uh, uh, so I, you know, I ended up getting my own TV show called uh, North of 62. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Just totally kidding. Uh, but uh, yeah, so um, I'm an aspiring uh, musician. Um I'll just start off first by saying that uh, I'm a, I'm a proud graduate of uh, of daycare. Actually, that's a lie. My mom pulled me out of daycare. Uh, I'm a proud graduate of kindergarten. Um, I'm also a proud graduate of grade eight. But uh, through through public school, um, I did experience a lot of bullying uh, for seven years exactly, and uh, to this day, I'm not really too sure why. All I know is that uh, it, it really made me understand the effects that bullying can have um, and that uh, vic victims of that can also become bullies themselves. That was my, my, my case and I don't hide that. Um, but once I got into high school, um, you know, I, I, I guess going through life, I always did my best to uh, stand up for people. Um, I was always aware of who I was. I was aware of my identity. Um, not once was I ever ashamed of being Anishinaabe. Um, I was always proud to be 
and then I started uh, I started singing uh, powwow music when I was about uh, 12 years old. That's when I got back into it. Um, but I, I was singing when I was real young with my dad before. And uh, that youth, the original youth drum that we had from Alderville was uh, uh, Burning Plains Singers. And uh, where our community is situated on Rice Lake, uh, the story of that lake was uh, known as Pemidash uh, Kadayan, which means Lake of Burning Plains. Um, <clears throat> high school was interesting. Uh, experienced some racism here and there, um, but uh, again, not enough, I guess, for me to really be ashamed of who I was. And even if it was enough, I, I still don't think I'd ever be ashamed. Um, and then I really got into uh, power singing through high school. Um, struggled academically all my life, um, but, uh, you know, persevered through a lot of help with my teachers and um, you know, people from back home. And uh, I didn't really um, experience the whole partying scene through high school. Uh, it never really interested me. Um, but once I, once I moved out and got into my adult life, you know, I started experiencing things and, and uh, kind of opened my eyes about it with, uh, about, you know, addictions and whatnot. Um, I proudly graduated high school, uh, took a few years off for uh, post-secondary, but then I, I eventually went on to, to attend Canador College at North Bay for the Police Foundations program. Um, through my college experience, you know, experienced some mental health uh, obstacles, which again, opened my eyes uh, with people um, in regards to mental health and that it can happen to anybody. Um, realized that I didn't want to become a cop, uh, especially since I was about to uh, become a, uh, a father with my partner at the time. And uh, we welcomed our beautiful boy who's now four years old. Um, but then I, I realized that I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to work with Indigenous youth in a more of an educational setting um, because that was the experience that I had. So I, I went on to become an Indigenous support worker with the Sudbury Catholic District School Board. And a lot of people questioned my my uh, reasoning as to why I was working in the Catholic school board and my reasoning was saying because they hired me. <laughs> uh, but it was, it was uh, quite the experience. I gained a lot of experience and met a lot of great people. Uh, it came with its challenges though. Um, and now I'm currently an Indigenous graduation coach with the uh, Nipissing Perry Sound Catholic District School Board. And uh, I've just been loving every, every moment of it. Um, but on the side, I do a lot of a, uh, a lot of round dance singing and powwow singing um, and some contemporary music. And both of those things have really helped me throughout my life. Um, they've, they've helped me uh, kind of stay on a good path and express, uh, express my emotions in the way that I feel most comfortable with um, songs or, or, or storytelling. And um, uh, it helps me learn my language when I, when I do round dance or powwow. Uh, of uh, Nishinaabemowin. We all have our different ways of learning. That's what always helps me. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Um, I have uh, my Instagram handle is uh, Moet Sings, M-O-W-A-T. Um, same with Twitter, but I'm not too, I'm not too active on Twitter, but it is the same, Moet Sings. Um, you can find me on YouTube under Jordan Moet, where I post uh, covers and uh, my round dance music. Um, you can also check out my contemporary music uh, available on iTunes and Spotify. Um, I go under the name My Friend the Moon. Um, currently going to be working or continuing to work on our debut uh, EP slash uh, album as the full band. Uh, but yeah, uh, with that, I'll just leave one last message for, for everybody here um, in our Anishinaabe language. And it goes... Uh, 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 be proud of the teachings that uh, that you'll receive through life. Uh, be proud uh, um, you're Anishinaabe. So, miigwech uh, for all of you for listening, and uh, I was really happy to be part of this. Thank you. Bon pi. Thank you, Jordan, so much for sharing your story and truth with us tonight. I saw some YouTube videos of Jordan singing and he has an amazing voice. So please everyone check him out.
Our next speaker is Carrie Ann Peacock, chef and owner of Indigenous Catering. Welcome, Carrie Ann. Hani Bojo, Carrie Ann Peacock Indigenous, Wasaxing First Nation in Dondraba. Um, yeah. Oh, there I am. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, I am the owner of Indigenous Catering. Uh, before this, um, I just went under uh, private chef and catering services just under my name for the past few years. Um, and recently I developed a brand. Um, so I'm kind of excited about that, uh, the new development. Um, so I guess where do I begin? Um, so what brought me into the culinary um, Sorry, <laughs> it's been a long day. It's like, um, I recently went, well, not recently, I attended Durham College um, for culinary management. And for the second year of the course, we were the very first group of students to ever attend um, the school in Whitby. So it was quite the experience to help um, to develop the programs and um, create the vision that was there. I kind of wish, um, I was able to experience like the orchards and all the horticulture and the farming aspect of it. Um, so now currently, um, along with the catering, I'm actually um, leaning towards more like food security, gardening and seed, um, growing and saving seeds. Um, and I've been working with like the Durham Policy Food Council. Um, but right now my business is uh, part-time because I have two little ones, two under five. And I believe like uh, the very early years are like the most important and they help to develop the little humans and to be the best people that they can be. So I've been doing this part-time. Um, and so far I've just been networking uh, word of mouth, um, which is doing really great. Um, that's the pace that I'm able to keep at the moment. Um, Cause I also work part-time with Carrier Community Health Center um, on the indigenous team. I'm the indigenous chef there and program support. So with that, I've been there for like five years um, and I get to create um, Indigenous-based programs, I do Indigenous community kitchens, I get to share my knowledge, share the recipes, um, teach techniques, um, and just like help to create the sense of community, um, which I really love because I've been there a long time. Um, and with that, I also get to cook and prepare foods for like the big drum socials. Um, and what I love about that is that I get um, full creativity. So I can use like game meats like bison and elk meats. And um, even one year I even did a whole menu and it's actually vegetarian um, and no one knew otherwise and they all loved it. Um, and that being said, another reason why I chose to be in the culinary uh, field is because I went through some health issues, um, you know, just like, enjoying the western diet um, and with that like it really affects our bodies to the point where like we become so sick and I was at that point so I ended up losing like over like 100 pounds I had to research everything into the um, food industry the production lines everything and with that I had to make a conscious choice so I chose to be a vegan at the time so for about eight years and now I transitioned to vegetarian and a lot of people I get in conversations with a lot about being indigenous and um, choosing plant-based um, and to me, it goes, I think it goes hand in hand, depending on how you look at it. Um, it's one thing to choose to eat something at Burger King um, with beef that's had a, like a terrible life versus our game meat, how we respectfully hunt them and treat them that they've lived a good life um, and that we use everything about it. So if I would eat meat, it would be um, one that's been like, you know, hunted and given like tobacco put down and like through prayers and stuff, which is a huge difference, right? So... And that led me to want to open a restaurant. Um, and then working with the community health center, um, being a nonprofit, I was able to, you know, help foster and share that vision um, and share healthy food. Cause we do a lot of like food security things. Um, so I know I got five minutes, I'm kind of going like phew, through it all. <laughs> um, so I've been to a lot of powwows and I find that with that, it costs a lot of money to eat just like even just like french fries or something like the cheapest right um and our traditional foods and I want to make sure my food is accessible um so people get a chance to order a chance to have it um and I do have bannock on my menu um and a few other things that are you know are 
colonial aspects. So that's only based on because I value memories. Um, and a lot of us share the memories of like growing up with, you know, feeling safe and secure with a little piece of Bannock. And a little bit is okay in moderation, right? Just not like a whole lot, <laughs> right? Um, so, and throughout the years, I've talked to a lot of like elders, uh, medicine men, like um, Bajabin and Joseph, um, and a lot of like really great people in our community, um, as well as uh, my own in Soxie First Nation. So, and have really great um, friends and networking that everyone likes to share um, recipes and just talking about stuff and just, you know, supporting one another. And it's absolutely amazing. So, um, what do you think? So yeah, so I hope to expand more in the next year when both my children are going into kindergarten um, and I have more time to that to develop, which I think is amazing. And oops, I think I covered it all. I don't know what time it started. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, I do a lot of um, consultation. Um, so I have like a set menu, but if there's something that you want to try, something you want to work with, we can create a menu, work on it. You know, pretty flexible. Um, miigwech, and thank you for listening. Bye, my Thank you so much, Carrie Ann, for sharing your story and your journey with us tonight and telling us about some of your amazing recipes. It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Kyron Potts. Kyron is a passionate youth advocate and resource developer for the Two-Spirit community. He is also a model, comedian, and content creator on platforms such as Instagram, TikTok, and Twitch. Welcome, Kai. I think they might have been having some connection issues, so I don't know if they made it. Okay, we can move on to the next speaker for now. Um, so our next speaker is Karen Recolet, Indigenous educator and assistant professor from the University of Toronto. Welcome, Karen. Hi, thank you. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Coming through, good, okay. Uh, so I am honored to be a part of this conversation. It's so beautiful. This is the first time I've ever actually sat in a space in the Durham region that gathers all of these folks together. So I feel very appreciative to be a part of this. So thank you for the invitation. And I just have been loving, like witnessing this conversation. So thank you for that. Um, let's see. So I am Cree. Um, I'm originally from Sturgeon Lake, Saskatchewan, and I live in Curtis. Um, I was adopted um, at a young age and grew up in Southern Ontario and around here, actually. And um, let's see, I have a daughter and she's amazing. Um, she's 10 years old and I have a partner who's amazing. Um, and life is really good. <laughs> um, there's been some struggles, um, but life is, is really good. Uh, let's see, I can tell you a little bit about um, my journey, but also I, I think I just wanna kind of hold space for um, the need for a vocabulary or a way of speaking about urban diasporic indigenous life and living and love and joy um, that doesn't have to presume or doesn't always have to default to what we have needed to overcome. We are very strong and we have obviously overcome, <laughs> um, but my writing and my thinking has been being an Indigenous adoptee in response to the to the language practices, there's always stuck me kind of at a deficit. So in between two worlds, someone who's lost, um, someone who doesn't know who they are, or someone who has no vision of a future or imaginary or imagining an otherwise possibility. Um, so my work has been kind of thinking through what are the gestures, what are the movements, what are um, 
the poetics around landing in a city, in a diaspora with um, in indigenous and um, black kin relatives. What is that space of in-betweenness that can be about um, ascension and um, joy? How do we land into relation? How do we lean into each other in ways that we do not have to set um, rupture as the default? So my work has been about examining sort of black speculative fiction, um, you know, writing from Octavia Butler, um, N.K. Jemison, Nalo Hopkinson, and thinking about my own landing practice as an indigenous adoptee, um, how I have landed into place. And so I have recently been interested in textiles and quilting. So I have been teaching myself through YouTube videos how to quilt. And my vision, my goal with this is to create star quilts. Um, um, so some of the projects that I work on is working in relationship to um, my First Nation in Saskatchewan. Uh, there's three elders there that are wanting to work with the youth around star quilting and teaching them how to star quilt. So, and there's also elders here that know how to star quilt and can share those, those teachings. So um, I have been collaborating with folks and trying to bring this uh, vision into fruition to create these star glyphs, these landing glyphs for folks who are on the move, who are diaspora, who are, um, who are landing into place so that we can create this vocabulary that doesn't have to be rooted in loss, but can be rooted in what is generative about an alternative landing practice. And what are the ways in which we lean into each other how do we find chosen kin? How do we build these relationships when, you know, for reasons of settler colonialism and settler colonial violence and dispossession, you know, we are now in a position where um, building kin is something that we can be agentic about and we can make our own choices about. Um, and so, so, yeah, so I'm excited about the future and I'm looking forward to other collaborations. Um, I think about like gathering a lot. How do we gather? What are the shapes of our gatherings? When we're in digital spaces like this, what are the ethics of gathering that are non-consumptive? So everybody wants to see, you know, to think through like, um, you know, indigenous knowledge as something that they can just kind of like put in their pockets, right? And, and walk with. But, you know, there's all kinds of indigenous knowledges and there's ways of carrying those knowledges that that person might not have. So I'm thinking a lot about extraction and about how do we share knowledges in ways that can't be mined or extracted? Um, what are the transmissions? you know, what, what are those um, traces of joy and care, you know, and, and how can we bundle those up and, um, and share them with each other. So, yeah, I also work at U of T, sorry, I forgot. Um, that was a, a journey in itself. Um, and as a person who probably couldn't have been a student at U of T, um, I am now a professor there. So, um, but all this to say that, you know, it, for me, it's not like a linear thing, you know, from here to there and look at that. It's more like, these are a series of relationships that I've had, you know, the honor to build. And for me, it's all about relationality and gathering and sharing and, and, and unknowing, sometimes not even knowing and becoming and in a perpetual state of becoming this. And I think that's okay. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to share.
Um, I look forward to further gatherings and uh, I hope you're all having a beautiful, beautiful night. Thank you, Karen, so much for sharing your truth and your knowledge with us tonight. Your story is truly inspirational, so thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Ashley Wynn, founder of Sage and Sunshine Culture Private School. Welcome, Ashley. Aha, okay. Um, so I know that we're running out of time, um, so I'm just gonna make this quick. Um, let me first say that you're all so amazing. Miigwech, miigwech, miigwech for everything you're doing. It's amazing. Um, so Ani, Ashley Dishnikas, I'm an early childhood educator and a mother of four. This September, I'll be opening um, Sage and Sunshine School where I will empower indigenous children and help restore indigenous language and culture the same way it was stolen. I'm not a fluent speaker, but I'm going to bring in all the connections and resources that I've came across through my journey of connecting to my roots. Like many Indigenous children, the public school system failed me. I was singled out by teachers, bullied by students, and ultimately fell through the cracks of a system that did not value me. Um, teachers expected me to know everything about Indigenous studies, even though they weren't teaching it to me. Um, I was a good student behavior wise, but I struggled to learn in a formal way. Um, I've been displaced from my culture through similar systems and fight to ensure that my, my children have access to their culture cultural identities. I have advocated for an education that values traditional knowledge. Um, 10 years ago, I advocated for Anishinaabe mowing class in the public school board in Peterborough. And they offered my daughter a one hour evening class downtown, which was not very convenient, but we made it work. And that ran for four years. And then when the teacher left, it wasn't, she wasn't replaced and um, it was just kind of forgotten. So then I went to the local friendship center and I got another one hour per week um, Anishinaabe Moen class for uh, my family to attend. And um, it was, again, just an extracurricular activity and that wasn't enough for me. So um, during COVID-19, when all the schools shut down, I was able to um, take full responsibility of my children's education. And I incorporated language and culture into our everyday schooling. And um, I was posting online what we were doing and some videos we made. And other families um, started using us as a resource for, for, the, for themselves. And um, uh, even some families were, uh, that were struggling with online school with their children. Um, sent their their children to me to to help them out with that. So I got to meet some local children. Um, I belong to the Turtle Clan, which are traditionally responsible for teaching and healing. So I am honored to start this journey for the generations to follow. Um, I I think this it's really important and. And now is the time. So thank you very much for having me tonight. And miigwech again. Thank you, Ashley, so much for sharing your story with us this evening. You are truly an inspiration. And I encourage everybody to check out your school. And the link will be posted in our chat. So I'm just waiting to hear if we're able to get Kai back as our last speaker. And then if not, we will move on to our Q&A with all of our panelists. Um, I think we can do the Q&A and I will share links for Kai. Perfect. So we're gonna bring all of our speakers back onto the screen.
Okay, so our first question is for the two chefs in the panel. And it was, do you have a favorite dish that you love to prepare? So let's start with Tamara. That is a tough question. Um, I feel like that changes with every season for me. Um, something that I've really been enjoying making this year, uh, not so much in the summertime, but is a bison stew. Um, I've used a lot of uh, indigenous mushrooms in there to get, just really get that earthy flavor in there. And then of course, you know, squash and beans uh, and corn in there as well. Um, every flavor in the stew is very distinct and true to what it is. Um, and I think that's the best part of the dish. Thank you. And Carrie Ann, do you have a favorite recipe to share? Hello. Uh, yes. So very similar to uh, what Tamara was saying. Um, we do a three sister stew um, with a lot of like squash beans. And then I use like the lied corn, the hominy corn, which gives that extra like meaty texture. Um, yeah, it's just one of my favorites. It's good all year round. And yeah. Oh, and I like right now working with um, sunflower paste so I like to make cookies with and just like baking things so really good thank you much thank you so our next question is from michelle who says i'm confused when it said indigenous folks have overcome when we're still being slaughtered land hasn't been given back with interest laws haven't been changed Profit is still being made through systems, institutions and policies of oppression and exploitation and racism is still fully active please advise so do any of our panelists have any thoughts on Michelle's comment and question? I can chime in on this. Um, I think that um, we've overcome in a, in a different sense. I think we've overcome in the sense that we're resilient and you know we're finding different avenues of um, resurgence, whether it's taking back our language or um, healing ourselves or healing our families. Um, I can't speak to where it specifically came from, but I think that there are ways that indigenous folks are overcoming um, from very small things to big things, um, you know, graduating high school, uh, connecting back to their communities, things like that. Um, however, I do agree that um, there's also still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, and, um, there's still a lot of things actively happening, like um, genocide and, and um, a lot that still needs to be addressed, so. Thank you. And I will open it up to see if anyone else has anything to add or share following Jaylin. I, uh, I, I also agree with uh, uh, Jaylin as well. And I guess like from my own experience too, uh, especially when it comes to language. I mean, my, my mom and dad, uh, my dad, especially, he's not a fluent speaker at all. Uh, my mom, she can understand it. And she's spoken um, the language as well. But um, when I was sharing before how I've learned the language through uh, when I when I compose my uh, powwow songs in the Nishinaabe and, uh, and, and now like being to where um, uh, where I reside right now, like I, I'm surrounded by language, and um, uh, and I guess being a power singer too, like I, I'm learning all these these songs and these protocol songs, um, lodge songs, and to me that's kind of what I'm taking back. Uh, what you know, the residential school system took away from my from my Mishomas. And uh, now I'm, I'm kind of, I'm taking that back now because, you know, I'm a father of two and now I'm able to, to teach my kids Ojibwe and, and teach my kids how to sing. Um, so that, that's what I have to share about that. that that's a very, very uh, uh, great um, um, conversation to be had though. Thank you, Jordan. 
So our next question is for the speakers who mentioned the bullying and racism they experienced growing up, what advice would they give to children today who may experience the same thing? Or what advice would they give to their younger self? And they are all such wonderful examples of resurgence and success. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll speak on this as well. Um, the, the mis I guess I would just say is that uh, for myself, I, I didn't tell anybody what I was going through. Um, I never told my parents. I never told a teacher or a principal because I was more worried about, uh, about being cool. Um, and, you know, I, I paid the price for, for seven years uh, with that. Um, there we go. Um, and I paid, I paid the price for seven years. So I guess what I would say is just, you know, don't worry about um, your image. I mean, when I, when I finally addressed it to a principal, all he said was, uh, like, you, you're really scared to be called, you know, a tattletale for two days. Do you want to know how many names I get called in a day? And I still come to work and do my job. And your job is, is to be a student. So um, just don't be afraid to stand up for yourself. Don't be afraid to stand up for others. And uh, sometimes it's okay to, to, to still be a loser. I mean, look at me, look where it got me. And I, I still feel pretty damn good about myself. Thank you, Jordan. We had a question for Thomas as well. Um, and someone asked, how do I support my indigenous friends who are in professional sports if they're faced with bullying and racism? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I guess just to kind of listen to them, be supportive, uh, try to learn the culture as much as you can. I know for myself, I had to uh, kind of learn the culture as well. Like I had to uh, learn about residential school, the 60 scoop. And I feel like just, just learning about that and just educating yourself is uh, just showing, uh, I guess, whoever it is that you're there to support them. Great, thank you. I just have one final question, which is indigenous joy is an act of reclamation. What's bringing you all joy lately? So does anyone want to tackle that one? I see Jaylin is pointing to her little one. Uh, culture, dancing, family, I can keep on going. I everything gives me joy just to wake up and be indigenous just to wake up and be indigenous i that brings me joy to be able to share my culture to be able to be here with all these indigenous people and to share our stories in under five minutes like dang we're good we're good we got this and we're only going up from here and like all these matriarchs that i see here these little babies like oh we're gonna be good and we're even gonna get better like I have nothing to worry about. I know we're gonna get good, um, especially because our people are hungry and we want the best for the next seven generations because our last past seven generations, they looked after us because we're still here and we're still practicing our culture and we're still talking and with other indigenous people and non-indigenous people. So, you know what, I'm happy. I got everything I need, the air in my lungs, the sun rises, the grass grows and the river flows. As long as that's all there, that's all I ever need. So yeah, I'm happy. Thank you. Thank you, Beanie, so much. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up our Q&A and move on to the next part of our program. Uh, but I just wanted to thank all of our incredible speakers for being with us tonight. You are all such an inspiration. Miigwech. It is now my pleasure to welcome back our elder, Dorothy Taylor, a Mississauga Anishinaabe elder from Curve Lake First Nation. Dorothy sits as the elder on the Ontario Tech Indigenous Education Advisory Circle and is known for her work in traditional teachings about the sacredness of water. She is the founder of the Sacred Water Circle. Inspired by traditional Indigenous teachings, the Sacred Water Circle sees a restored relationship between human communities and water. 
We feel so grateful that Dorothy was part of our first event, Reconciliation, as well as a panelist at our second event, Resistance. And she is again joining us tonight to lead us through a smudge. Welcome, Elder Dorothy Taylor. My name is Dorothy. I'm from Curve Lake First Nation. I'm the White Porcupine Clan. And um, I'm going to sing a song and uh, a prayer song uh, to close this wonderful event. I said I was really happy tonight to hear the sacred stories of, the, of all the speakers tonight. Amazing. I know about four of you personally. So I, I'm it's so proud that we as Indigenous people, we have st stood resilient. We've had our prayers, our ceremonies, our courage, and our sharing and forgiveness has kept our culture alive. We are still alive and our children who are being born now onto seven generations will also know what the, the health and the healing and the beautiful stories that many of these speakers shared tonight will bring to the, our future generations. Naha miigwech. So I, I, I don't even know how to end this. This has been such an amazing evening. Uh, this collaboration came together a number of months ago and there were a number of things that we wanted to highlight. One of them um, was to promote allyship and another to increase Indigenous voice and also recognize that Indigenous people are 
still here. There has been a constant erasure of Indigenous people because sometimes we don't show up how you think we should. And I think the little tiny drop in the bucket of amazingness from Indigenous folks that are within this region, we were able to highlight tonight. And this by no means is a full representation. It is just the amount of people that we could squeeze in this two hour session. So the messages that I heard tonight, um, well, and here I have to be honest, I always say I never come prepared because I always let the tobacco do the talking. Well, today I tried to write something, it's out the window. And I've been holding my tobacco all day and I realized I just honestly have to always trust the tobacco. And my heart is so filled with joy today to be able to see the amazing things that we have done and the messages that I hear around the circle and the hoop and our medicines and the way that we understand and our connections to the earth, to community with each other. And, you know, more than anything else, we are here because of the resilience and the strength of our ancestors. And every morning I wake up and I am so grateful. You know, we can, and, and, and that's also what we wanted to show is that we are not stuck in a, a negative narrative. We have overcome, we are overcoming, we are successful. We are successful in business, we are successful in the arts, we are successful in whatever it is that we choose to do. And our connection to our ancestors is apparent in the way that we understand that the work we do. And I invite everyone to continue on this path. This is the fourth in, the, in our series, Resurgence. And again, this is just to highlight that Indigenous people are here. We are well, we are alive. We are making contributions. We are thriving. Our communities are healing. Our communities are well. Our communities are... are we're having babies too. So that's amazing to hear. And we're creating school systems that support indigenous learning and value that. So I'm just so uh, amazingly happy this evening. I'm so filled with gratitude and joy. And I think that we have accomplished, you know, understanding that indigenous people are still here. We are still alive. And we want to continue this journey together with reconciliation. That, you know, this is a path that people get on. No matter where you are on this path, we invite you to continue the journey. The journey of self-education, of you know, uh, learning more, engaging with indigenous people, creating authentic, a meaningful relationships that are mutually beneficial and not extractive, you know, and not uh, that, that are real. Uh, and so we have decided that we wanted to create another session. There will be no panel members, but it is a review and we will hopefully be able to get to the answer that we were unable to um, get to during our all of our sessions, as well as the opportunity for you to meet um, some Indigenous peoples who are part of this collaboration and begin to develop those relationships in a real authentic way. So relationship building and review will be on um, September 9th. I think everyone will be getting a follow-up email from Eventbrite and you will be able to register for that event. So thank you so much for all of our amazing speakers. It's so wonderful to, to hear that, you know, success doesn't also come just like that, that it is not a, a line from A to B and that's absolutely okay. We have to understand that with success comes a lot of failure. And so when we understand that failure in itself is a lesson and one that is to be embraced, we are well on our way. So support, 
you know, your indigenous community members, your family, your friends, you know, we are, we have the ability to uplift each other in ways that our environment needs, that our hearts need. And we have to continue to think about what kind of ancestors do we want to be? Because we also have responsibilities and obligations to those that have not yet arrived. And so when we understand that our responsibility is to ensure that that path is clear for them and doing the work from the heart, we will all you know, just be in a joyful place. So miigwech to everyone for coming and attending this evening. This series has been um, so amazing. I know there was a question earlier around why it wasn't in, led by Indigenous folks. Originally, this collaboration started between conversations with some Indigenous people. And we understand that in order to make things better and greater, we need the support of other community members as well. And so that's why we engaged other, you know, libraries, the region. Um, and we were able to leverage the gifts that people from each of these organizations carried so that we could have a seamless presentation for you. And so I am not a tech person. So thank goodness for Liz Morris and the folks at DCSI who supported that for Jessica Treanor, uh, who started with the Pickering Library, who has created all of our opening videos. I want to acknowledge and thank um, Elder Dorothy Taylor for opening and closing our session. Um, and to everyone who's really dug in and taken um, pieces of the work that they're good at so that we can continue to provide these offerings for you. And it's when we look at what gifts people have and we utilize those that we can make um, the dream team happen. And that's how it works. So miigwech for everyone attending. I hope you continue on your journey. I hope you're able to join us on September 8th to really start that uh, relationship building. And I'm not even sure if I introduced myself, but you know, Ani Bojo, Wasanangishgang Indijinakas, Neashingi Ming and Dinjaba, Curtis and Ninji, Mashik and Dadem, Anishinaabe Kwe, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, French and Dao. And uh, again, I am so pleased that everyone has been able to attend. I work at Durham College's First Peoples Indigenous Center. And I am so grateful for all of the stories, all of the successes, all of the truths. They are the stories of who we are and what we carry are so vitally important to our success, our continued success and our future. So miigwech everyone, have a wonderful evening and bamaki.